you read about in medical school that you can't breathe and sleep on the pillows. They run multiple drugs for symptoms. They have symptoms of really minimal physical activity. And in this group of patients, um, we're probably primarily going to focus on here. And these are the patients that get the cardiac resynchronization devices. These are the people that are fairly high risk for uh, lethal arrhythmias and getting by the layers. And then finally, the class D patient. This patient is really beyond medical and technological therapy. This person needs a new heart. This is somebody with end-stage congestive heart failure whom the risk of a device implant may far exceed any potential benefit, whose myocardium is beyond salvage, and who just needs a new heart. So we'll primarily concentrate in this group, but maybe a little bit in here. Because obviously, this is a progressive condition and you want to avoid uh, more severe disease. So how did people with heart failure die? Uh, if you look uh, at this chart, the incidence of mortality increases as your ejection fraction decreases. Most of the cutoffs for implementing these devices use an ejection fraction of around 30% of the normal being, you know, 55 to 60%. There's a fairly even mixture between arrhythmic death and other cardiac death, which is uh, pump death or uh, progressive, progressive uh, heart failure. Oops. Where are you different layers? <clears throat> so this is just a brief timeline describing the evolution of internal defibrillators. The first human implants were really done in the early to mid-80s, but really the modern era began about here. Okay. Where, let's see, that was when I was an intern. So the use of transvenous leads, leads that go inside the vessels rather than larger than part of the patches, the biphasic waveform, which allowed for more efficient and lower uh, defibrillation energies, smaller devices, memory, and whatnot. And then around here came the uh, secondary prevention trials. Somebody that had an arrest and survived a uh, little better year. Here, in this era, we're looking at primary prevention trials. Most people that have cardiac arrest don't survive their first event. So if you want to save lives, somehow you have to predict who's at high risk of having an arrest, put in the device before they have their arrest. And here, modern era, we're expanding indications for people that have non ischemic cardiomyopathy, again, mostly primary prevention, focusing on uh, people that have yet to have their arrest. And as you can see, the number of devices implanted has been going up exponentially, which is why the uh, device companies are doing so well at this stuff. So how do ICDs work? Uh, quite simply, they detect tachycardia, usually using some combination of a rate criterion plus stability and variability. They have the ability to look at QRS pathologies to see if they're narrow, if they're wide. They can deliver a variety of therapies. In this case, this device is capable of delivering traditional anti-tachycardic pacing, which in this case accelerated the tachycardia. And finally, if that fails, an actual shot. So how do you get an IC? Basically, there are two ways to earn yourself a third layer primary prevention and secondary prevention. So what secondary prevention is, is if you've had an arrest and survived, you get a defibrillator. Okay, so these are class one indications. There's no debate about them. These are the no-brainer indications. These are supported by trials. So if somebody has a cardiac arrest due to PT or DF, not due to some electrolyte or reversible cause or ingestion or something like that, they have spontaneous sustained VTAC and a structurally abnormal heart. They have syncope without uh, clear explanation and an abnormal heart positive EP study, and other things like that. So there are very, um, there's very little controversy in, in secondary prevention. If you had a lethal arrhythmia, it's not surprising to be the device. The class two indications are uh, less well established. Uh, the risks are slightly lower. But these are basically the primary prevention indications. Somebody that you think is at high risk for uh, having arrhythmia, although they've not yet had it. So people with depressed ejection fraction that are remote from their myocardial infarction. And the depressed function, and they've already undergone revascularization to improve their coronary perfusion to the best of their ability. BT while awaiting transplants. Some of the genetic conditions that are associated with higher risk of sudden death, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, long PT syndrome, as well as uh, syncope with abnormal heart, right bundle with ST7 elevation, which is the Brugatus. So 
Now these are sort of the categories of the major clinical trials that are out there. Um, I won't talk too much about the secondary prevention trials. These were three large trials that, that came along in the, in the early 90s. So why don't we talk a little bit about primary prevention in ischemic heart disease. So one of these trials, the MEDA trial, looked at placement of defibrillators in people with ischemic cardiomyopathy, and it had to have a few inclusion criteria. They had to be a few weeks out from their MI, they had to have low ejection fraction, and they had to have inducible VT at the time of an EP study. They were randomized to defibrillator or, no, or conventional medical therapy. And you can see here that there's, and the, when you look at these trials, you know, keep in mind sort of the two-year time point. This trial's done going forever, and that's a good number to sort of have in, in your mind. So people on conventional therapy, two-year survival, was about 70-ish percent. So 30 percent died within two years with conventional medical therapy. The defibrillators, they did better. Somewhere uh, near 90 percent survived two years. So you can see here that ICD therapy in this group of patients improved survival versus conventional therapy. The MUST was also a trial looking at people with uh, ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy that had coronary artery disease, they had to have VT, ejection fraction less than 40, inducible VT on EP testing. So they were also randomized to either a defibrillator, EP guided therapy plus a defibrillator, EP guided therapy with no defibrillator. <coughs> So EP-guided therapy with no defibrillator was the way things were done in the, in the late 80s. These were people that had inducible uh, VT at the time of the uh, EP study. They were placed on drug after drug after drug, and they got another EP study after each trial. And when they found a drug that they were not inducible on, that's the drug that they went on. So we can see here that um, the people that had EP-guided therapy without an ICD did no better than conventional therapy. So EP-guided therapy <coughs> doesn't work. Okay. People with an ICD did better. And the Meta 2 trial, uh, this trial um, was an important trial because this trial says you don't even need an EP study. Okay. So people with ischemic cardiomyopathy, LVEF less than 30%, they didn't care whether you had an EP study or not. I mean, none of these people had an EP study. They got randomized. The ICD versus conventional therapy, and again, two-year mortality with conventional therapy, somewhere around 80% survival, somewhere around 20% mortality with the defibrillator, significantly <laughs> better. So you don't even need an EP study to guide you there. Just put the defibrillator in. If they had a heart attack, and their ejection is bad. So one of the questions that came along after these trials were published were, is defibrillator therapy equally applicable in people that have not ischemic cardiomyopathy. And in the adult world, this usually takes the form of an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, sometimes familial. It's often attributed to uh, viral infections of the heart or myocarditis. But not ischemic cardiomyopathy is defined as absence of coronary artery disease for respiratory. And there were a number of uh, trials that looked at the use of defibrillators in non ischemic heart disease. And the reason that they divided this up is, you know, the event rates in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy are lower than that of ischemic cardiomyopathy. The myocardial arrhythmogenic substrate is different. There are fewer scars, although there are scars present. So people weren't exactly sure whether defibrillators would be useful in this group here, both because of a lower event rate, and there was a feeling that ventricular tachycardias would be less prevalent and the mode of death would be something more in the bradycardic family, like uh, electromechanical dissociation or just simple you know, asystole for the heart to stop. And you would imagine that a defibrillator in that setting really wouldn't uh, make much of a difference. So uh, this trial here, uh, the SCADHEP trial, uh, was actually a non-industry uh, sponsored trial. This was sponsored by the NIH that looked at uh, amiodarone versus defibrillator uh, for uh, treatment of congestive heart failure. I just said that in people with non cardiomyopathy. This is the largest device trial that's ever been done. So they had the uh, inclusion, they had to have dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, they did have an ischemic arm as well as a, a non-ischemic arm, ejection fraction less than 35%. New York heart class two or class three symptoms, that would mean symptoms with significant exertion or symptoms with minor exertion, but not symptoms of rest. Uh, they underwent some baseline testing, including their walk capabilities and holders, and they were randomized to three groups, conventional medical therapy, amiodarone, antiarrhythmic therapy, 
and and the um, conventional medical therapy was quite good. These people were on beta blockers, they were on ACE numbers, there were all the medications that um, previous studies had been uh, shown to improve life and extend survival in this condition. So if you look at the uh, survival in uh, this guy have trial, at the two year mark, yeah, only about 12% mortality. So it's about half of what we saw in these ischemic groups. We analyzed that, and this is one of the reasons why this trial went on for five years. It took five years for these curves to diverge. Actually, they started to diverge around here. But it took a while for this study to meet statistical significance. But if you look at a three year uh, time point, those people that had ICD therapy had roughly a 15% mortality rate, 85% survival, while those on amiodarone or on conventional medical therapy had about a 25% mortality rate or 75% survival. No difference between amiodarone and conventional medical therapy. So, amiodarone does not save lives. It reduces symptoms, it reduces ICD discharges, it does not prevent mortality. There's a fairly impressive relative risk reduction here, but the absolute risk reduction is only 7%. So, we'll see later on that this is an important number because it uh, defines the number needed to treat the same one life. But this is statistics. <coughs> So again, uh, ISDs, big statistical significant decrease in mortality, no effect in the world. So the Scott Half study concluded that patients with heart failure, low ejection fraction, with non ischemic cardiomyopathy, on optimal drug therapy, benefit with ICD therapy, and they did not benefit. So in summary, the way you get an ICD, secondary prevention, prior arrest, Primary prevention with ischemic or non ischemic cardiomyopathy, if you have low ejection, heart failure symptoms, and then uh, the insurance companies added on a QRS qualifier. It was not part of the trials because they had to find a way to correct the expenses. ICDs prevent sudden death but do not improve symptoms unless they're combined with uh, resynchronization pacing, uh, which is available. We'll talk about that next. The relative risk reductions are high. More than 20 50 percent relative risk reduction, but the absolute risk reduction is low. Okay, so if you take somebody with a 2 percent risk of sudden death and drop them down to a 1 percent risk of sudden death, that's a 50 percent reduction, relative risk reduction in mortality. Highly statistically significant. But you need to treat 100 people to save one life. Okay, so the average number needed to treat with these kind of numbers is about 15 people. So for every 15 defibrillators we put in, okay, one person loves us and 14 people hate us. I mentioned a little bit about resynchronization pacing uh, in, in heart failure or cardiac or, or CRT. Uh, where does this come along? Well, the CRT trials started right out here in the, in the mid-90s or so. They were sponsored by a number of different uh, companies. And you know, we don't have time to go through all of these. Basically, what they looked at, the hypothesis was, if you had a wide QRS, that's a sign of a ventricular conduction delay, that parts of your heart are not activated on time. And if you could hook up a pacing system such that you could pace into that bundle branch block, if there's a lot of bundle branch block, you could narrow the cure escalation, improve myocardial synchrony, and improve heart failure. So the early trials were um, small, there were crossover trials, really looking just at symptoms. And then there was a meta-analysis that came along that was very important that actually showed a survival benefit. And then later on, finally here in the, in the 2000 era, there were randomized control trials looking at survival with uh, cardiac disease. So what are the indications for cardiac resynchronization? Well, if you need a pacemaker because your heart's too slow, then that's an indication for CRT. So basically what you need is you need to have low ejection fraction, you need to have symptoms of heart failure despite medical therapy, you can have ischemic or non ischemic cardiomyopathy, and then this qualifier here. Okay? You need to have a long QRS. There has to be some sign that the conduction delay is part of the problem. If you just have bad myocardium, there are QRS, everything is symmetrically and evenly bad, pacing is not going to make any difference. Okay. And the uh, contraindications or class three indications would be somebody who's not really on medical therapy yet, or if there is an addressable lesion. Okay. Even the bypass operation of function is better. So what are the uh, mechanisms of cardiac uh, resynchronization therapy? Uh, we all know the cardiac conduction system, the impulse here starts at the sinus node, goes to the AD node, 
And then the impulse is spread to the ventricles via the right and the left muscle branch. Most commonly in adults with congestive heart failure and wide fluorosis, this is due to a left bubble branch block. There is either block or slowing of conduction in the left bubble branch, and there is delayed activation of the left ventricle from the right ventricle. So instead of the impulse being able to propagate evenly to both chambers, it comes down the right bundle, activates the right ventricle, and then works its way over here and activates the left ventricle late. And we'll see later in some images what that does to the actual uh, contraction. So this is a very famous slide that I uh, hired from the internet. Um, this is a myocardial strain image of a left ventricle. So what strain is, it's uh, change in length over initial length. So it's sort of like a local shortening fraction. Negative strain indicates that those segments are shortening, which is what muscle does during contraction. And red means that the muscle is in its neutral position. Okay. Yellow means that the fibers are actually being stretched from somewhere else. So this is what a normal heart looks like. You can see that all the fibers go blue, they all shorten, they all shorten at the same time, and nobody's getting stretched out. It goes from blue back to its baseline red. So here on, on the right is somebody with a dilated cardiomyopathy. Their heart's bigger to begin with, the chamber is more spherical, it's less ellipsoid, there's increased wall stress there by the phosphorus and the block. And this is what their contraction looks like. You can see that this area sort of goes blue, then this area goes blue, and when this area is blue, this area is yellow, and when this area is blue, this area is yellow. So this heart's not really squeezing, this heart's sort of wobbling. Okay, when parts of the heart are contracting, the other side of the chamber is elongated. So it'd be very difficult to generate an intercavitary pressure in an elastic bag if one wall is moving and the other wall is falling away. And obviously this re results in uh, reduced stroke volume, reduced ejection fraction, very inefficient use of, of an already weakened left brain. So this is the basis of this synchrony. This is what it looks like by ultrasound. So this is a left ventricle in the uh, apical uh, port chamber. This is the apex of the heart. You can use the valves up here. This is the mitral valve. This is an automated border tract of the endocardial surface. And this is a wide duress here. You can see that this wall fires and then this wall fires. And it goes separate through wall. And the heart just visually sort of wobbles back and forth. And this is the same patient um, once uh, cardiac resynchronization of the uh, pacing is turned on. It's still not perfect, but it's a lot better. So how do we achieve this? We try and do this uh, with um, as minimally invasive approach as, as possible. And it involves the standard configuration would be a lead up here in the right atrium for uh, atrial sensing, a lead down here in the right ventricle for uh, right side of pacing, and this is often a different way to do the, the first kind of combined device. And then how do we pace the left ventricle? Uh, you can't go inside the left ventricular cavity, this is the arterial chamber, and that would be set up for strokes, but fortunately there is a vein that runs around the outside part of the coronary sinus, and with some skill you can cannulate this thing and place a lead on the <coughs> LV epicardium within a coronary vein provide uh, left side uh, basically. If that's not doable for uh, any number of reasons or technical failure, then a surgeon can always uh, place that lead uh, with your transthoracic approach. So what were the trials looking at resynchronization pacing? So the miracle trial is one of the early trials, also published in that small journal, The Women's Women's Medicine. So it uh, included people with moderate to severe heart failure, class three or four, wide QRS, low ejection fraction, dilated heart. And they measured uh, things like six minute walk distance, they did some scores for quality of life and heart failure symptoms. And these people had to be on good heart failure medication. They need to be on ACE they need to be on ACE and blockers. And nothing changing. No recent surgeries, no recent heart attacks, radically stable. And the um, randomization went like this. They were implanted, they were randomized, so everybody got a device and they were randomized either to conventional um, that no pacing or with the serious pacing on, and then those that were uh, in the control group actually got crossed over. <coughs> so they looked at your heart failure score, your quality of life uh, survey, how far you can walk, 
they um, also measured some of these things quantitatively, what the peak oxygen consumption was, which is a good uh, correlation, uh, correlate of your exercise capacity, how big your heart was. And then they also looked a little bit at mortality as well as hospitalizations. And people with these devices very quickly walked farther. However, they walked farther almost instantaneously but they walk even further over time. So there may be a placebo effect here. It sort of cheered them on and motivated them. But there was definitely statistically significant increases in a six-minute walk over the six-month trial. <coughs> the heart failure questionnaire, likewise, they felt better. The minute you put that device in, so there may be a placebo effect there as well. But overall, people felt better. How much did they improve? About a third of people showed no change or worsening. This is important. Okay? When we say that with the typical things we, we tell families when we talk to people about CO2 devices, roughly you know, two thirds to three quarters of people respond. And that comes from this data. Most people, about half, improved one New York heart failure class. Some improved two or more. But some people didn't feel much better at all, and some actually worse. This is something that we have to keep in mind that a body system can make somebody worse. And we don't understand exactly why, but uh, hopefully we'll get a better feeling for that. And, and so again, improvement in walk distance, improvement in heart failure questionnaire, improvement in functional class. And they were able to control for the medications. So this was not influenced by what dose of may walk and whatnot. This is a medication independent effect. And in terms of the composite endpoint of death or hospitalization, they also seem to be better, but the study wasn't powered to look at that The meta-analysis that I mentioned added up all of these small crossover type trials. And basically what it showed are these three conclusions. By the particular pacing alone, it improves heart failure mortality. It does not affect non-heart failure mortality. So the incidence of cancer, the incidence of renal failure, all that stuff is the same. And because it improves heart failure mortality, it uh, almost but it used to just listen to things for all cause for health. So in summary, resynchronization therapy improves the symptoms of heart failure. It is independent of an additive to medical therapy, which is good. It appears to improve all cause mortality, and then this patient selection, device optimization, who gets a device and how you tune the device to each particular patient is still an area of problem. Now, this is an interesting question that comes up as well. Do all patients with heart failure need a defibrillator? If you look at the indications for a defibrillator, and you look at the indications for a biventricular pacemaker, they're almost identical. It describes the same group of people. Whether you have ischemic cardiopathy, not ischemic cardiopathy, low ejection fraction, heart failure symptoms. The only difference is the cure restoration. So if you have a wide QRS, Okay. But if you have a white QRS, you're also eligible for this. So in the United States, there's almost no role for a isolated biventricular pacing system based on these indications and the ability of our uh, healthcare system to afford it. In Europe, they do a lot more plain CRT. And why do they do that? There are a couple of trials here that uh, address that issue. This is a very important trial, the companion trial, because this actually looks at CRT, just biventricular pacing, CRT with backup defibrillation in people with heart failure. And it had a very elegant design. Patients were enrolled, they were randomized to one of three arms in a one to two to two ratio. So group one, and this, you know, the time of this trial was you know, almost unethical because of the other trials that showed a benefit. But these people, people got conventional medical therapy. You could never do this trial now. They got medical therapy plus biventricular pacing. They got medical therapy plus biometrical pacing with defibrillation capability. And of course they looked at, uh, the study was powered to look at mortality, hospitalization, and uh, heart failure exacerbations when people need to be admitted to the hospital. Okay, the eligibility criteria, had to have symptoms, had to have a wide duress, had to have low ejection fraction, had to have good medicines, and uh, no recent hospitalizations. So people that were presumably pretty stable. So this is the key slide here. 
in terms of time of hospitalization or death from a positive endpoint, again, at about a one-year time point now, about 37% of people had died or been hospitalized. This is a composite endpoint either one. While the people with uh, uh, bi-particular pacing or by the with interleaders would be better. And then this is all, all cause mortality here. And I think this is a really interesting slide. If you look you know, somewhere out here, this is conventional drug therapy. This is drug therapy plus IV pacing. And this is drug therapy plus IV pacing plus defibrillation. About two thirds of the benefit is here. About two thirds of the survival benefit of this device was from the IV pacing alone. And you picked up about another one third of the mortality benefit by adding the defibrillation capability. So the defibrillators do save lives. Biventricular pacing saves lives. But it seems like at least in this study, that you got most of the mileage from the IV pacing by improving the heart failure to improve the survival. And this was a subgroup analysis um, of that trial. And what did this reveal? It revealed people with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy tended to respond better. People with left bundle branch block tended to respond better. People with the widest TRS complexes tended to respond better. Okay. So if you had a narrow TRS, presumably you may not have had that much disagree. If you had ischemic cardiomyopathy, maybe you got a big infarct that doesn't really matter whether you pace it or not. But when you say those patients are sicker, Yeah, it's hard to say. When you look at two trials, there's a, I think it's, it's either Companion or Scott Hess versus this other trial, the Duffman trial. One showed a benefit for class three patients, one showed a benefit for class four, and nobody's now figured out how to reconcile that difference. They were the same patient group, and while one subset, you know, that's the problem with subgroup analysis, you're not really powered to teach that out. So uh, the conclusions of this, when added to optimal pharmacologic therapy in patients with moderate to severe heart failure, CRT and CRTD improves mortality and hospitalizations, and the CRT effect is, is the majority of it. Now finally, this trial here, uh, which was done in Europe after Companion had come out in the United States, this trial could never be done in the United States. And this was looking at by pacing alone. Okay, this trial was powered to look at mortality. So they looked at uh, all-cause mortality, as well as hospitalizations, randomized patients to optimal medical therapy or device. And these are the kind of numbers that, that uh, they got. So at, let's see, about two years there with the medical therapy, 60-some percent mortality with the IV. 40% mortality, 60% survival. With the IV, they about 75% survival. Again, statistically, it's better than survival alone without deferralization. So the um, results of this study demonstrate that CRT should be part of routine heart failure therapy in people with dyssynchrony. It improves cardiac function efficiency, improves symptoms quality of life, and reduces survival. And again, these are additive to best pharmacologic therapy. And lots of questions about it. So as of uh, last year, what, what are the criteria for getting CRT? It needs to be over 18 years of age. There aren't any studies in kids, not yet. You have to have significant symptoms, despite maximal medical management. You have to have electrical evidence of dyssynchrony. You have to have a dilated heart with poor function. And you can get it with or without a defibrillator, depending upon uh, what you want. Now, there are lots of other questions about cardiac resynchronization therapy. What do you do with people with bad function but not many symptoms? Okay, you improve their survival? Since they have no symptoms, they're class one, you can't make them feel any better. What do you do with those class four patients, which in some trials have shown benefit and other trials have not? You know, maybe the class four patient is analogous to that AHA class D, somebody with a burned out heart that just needs a new organ. What do you do with people with atrial arrhythmias? Um, 
in smaller trials, people that get AV node ablation and a regular pacemaker for a chronic atrial fibrillation versus AV node ablation and a BIV pacemaker, they seem to be better than BIV. What do you do with people with narrow QRS? But echo evidence of mechanical disorder. And which of the echo criteria best predict a favorable response to this? These are all unanswered questions. So let me talk just a little bit about pediatrics since that is the title of my talk. So the primary prevention of pediatric congenital heart disease, the RBL NTN study, the really very little in the next puppy trial. So uh, this was a presentation that I gave a couple years ago at the uh, heart, uh, pediatric heart failure meeting looking at would it playable defibrillators in patients uh, listed for cardiac transplant really uh, agree about them? Because in the adult literature, there are a number of uh, studies that say, regardless of your rejection fraction, regardless of your QRS width, if you are on a heart transplant list at a heart transplant center, you should have defibrillator. It's, it's kind of a big deal to put these things in in kids. We want to see if uh, this will work. So sudden death seems to be a major component of Adults with ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, the majority of sudden deaths occur with the initial men, so you have to go with the primary prevention approach. Obviously, you have to target high-risk populations, because if you put a bunch of devices in people that don't have events, then you're not going to benefit. And we really don't know the incidence of sudden death in the kids that are away from heart transplant. So our, hypo um, our hypothesis was that defibrillators would only improve survival in kids waiting for heart transplant if they had a lot of sudden death. If they didn't have a lot of sudden death, if they didn't have a lot of death, or if their deaths were mostly pump failure, then these devices probably would make a big difference. The defibrillators anyway. We'll talk about the body case in the next. So um, there's a large database, the PHTS database, which um, basically captures uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of all North American transplants. We queried it for a 10-year period. There are 24 participating institutions, over 2,000 patients. And of these 2,000 patients, 420 people died after listing, but before um, transplantation. So if you look here, in contrary to adults, we do pretty well with our, uh, our organ allocation. Within six months of listing for transplant, two-thirds of our patients have received a heart. This is a very much different in adults where a large number of patients die while waiting, they get a ventricular assist device and then die from complications of the VAD, or a smaller subset actually get a VAD and it becomes sort of destination here. You're on a ventricular assist device, you're not going to get a heart, you go as long as you go with the pump. But in kids, it seems that we do quite well with the organ application. Two thirds get transplanted within uh, six months of listening. 20% are still hanging around waiting, and only 16% died while waiting. So right here you can see that. Our survival after listening and before transplant is, is better. Both because the time of exposure is shorter, when you get them all done within six months, and the intrinsic rate of events is lower. How did they die? 40% of them died from pump failure. A number died from multi organ failure, a number suffered, suffered uh, neurologic events, these are usually uh, take the form of embolic strokes. Some died of infections and other complications from being instrumented in the intensive care unit. And only about 8% had a rhythmic death. And you can see that freedom from a rhythmic death is quite good. The vast majority of patients never experience a rhythmic death. The instantaneous risk of sudden death also goes down after listening. And that may be that they're getting on the proper medicines or they're just getting transplanted. We did identify a couple of risk factors for increased risk of sudden death. And interestingly, none of these made any difference. It didn't matter how bad your wedge pressure was or what your pulmonary pressures were at the time of your catheterization. It didn't matter whether you had congenital heart disease or prior surgeries. It didn't matter whether you had a history of arrhythmias. It was shocking. And it doesn't matter what uh, UMA status you were requesting, whether you were a class one patient on IV drugs or you were a class two patient sleeping. Things that did seem to matter where African Americans did a little worse, and rarely in pediatrics we actually do see an ischemic etiology. Those patients were at really high risk, six times, almost seven times relative risk. And the uh, medical surgical error man that mattered with uh, recent patients doing better than the earlier patients. And this probably represents 
uh, increased use of, of bed walkers and extenders in our water. So the status of listing was not significant. Black race was significant. And the, the era of uh, surgery was significant. But the earlier era is 93 and 99 showed higher mortality. This was the ischemic etiology. And we had a handful of patients with ischemic cardiomyopathies, but they had a markedly increased risk of subclinical. And in the pediatric population, but we don't have coronary artery disease from cholesterol, we have these kind of things. So iatrogenic injury, a congenital anomaly of the coronary, surgical procedures involving the aortic valve, again, congenital anomalies of the coronary, people with Kawasaki disease, afterwards their coronary arteries are not normal. Surgical things, embolic MIs, and uh, some other unusual conditions. So we concluded from this study that pediatric patients awaiting heart transplant have low overall risk of mortality and even lower risk of sudden death. It seems that most of our deaths are pulmonary. So therefore, ICD therapy in our population uh, should be restricted to established indications. However, there is a subgroup of patients that, in pediatrics that might benefit. And this would be the status 2 patient with some kind of ischemic element to their uh, disease. Because these are the patients that are going to wait a long time, they're sitting at home, they have a longer period of exposure to risk, and, and they might benefit from the therapy. Now what about resynchronization pacing? We uh, did a little uh, pilot study here, uh, about uh, 10 patients or so, we presented this at the Heart Association a couple years ago. So in adults, as you've seen, cardiac resynchronization therapy improves symptoms, and we um, hypothesized that it would work with kids too. So over about a one-year period, we had 11 uh, pediatric patients with moderate to severe heart failure and decreased ventricular function. And we used decreased function uh, less than 50% uh, ejection fraction and a wide QRS. And what we did, contrary to the adults, is we actually tried out CRT in the cath lab. We did, uh, deployed some temporary electrodes, did some pacing, and uh, saw if they responded either by hemodynamics or whether their echo looked better. People that responded underwent placement of permanent devices. People that did not respond did not get devices. And then afterwards, we tried to do some uh, echo bedded optimization. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And these were our results. This is what um, one of our patients looked like. We used conventional multipole catheters. This one is going across the atrial septum. This is mapping the left ventricle. This is one from the internal jugular approach mapping the right ventricle. We have an esophageal lead for atrial sensing. This patient was a toddler at 18 months of age. So these are the kind of simple mapping things that we've been able to accomplish so far. So this signal here is from the right ventricle. These four are from the left ventricle. This is the pure respiration. If you look here, the right ventricular electrogram is activated early. It's activated in the beginning of the QRS complex. All of the left ventricular signals are activated late. They're activated here, somewhere in the back half of the QRS. So with resynchronization pacing from this electrode here, we've advanced the timing of the LV such that it sits on top of the RV. And now the majority of these local electrograms occur sort of within the, the middle of the QRS or front of the QRS. And the total QRS width, as you can see, is increased. This is our most spectacular result with uh, by the pacing. You see there's an instantaneous rise in blood pressure as soon as we narrow the QRS. Most of our patients don't show this large increase, but this was a, a super expire. Here's the central venous pressure. That did not change. So this is not a preload thing. It's just improved ejection and efficiency of that, uh, of that heart. And when you think about those MR images, you know, we sort of turn the wobbling heart here into the more coordinated heart. Now we've tried to quantitate this with uh, tissue Doppler echo. And what tissue Doppler echo does is you can actually interrogate these tiny little uh, regions of interest and actually interrogate the myocardium or the blood pool. And this, there are a number of different indices you can use. This one is time to peak displacement. And you can see here that the different segments are peaking at different times. And this one doesn't peak at all. Okay, so if you look at the time, the peak, it's dispersed. And this is in, in, the, in the baseline condition. And then when we turn off the CRT, the curves are not normal. The amplitude of these curves is Love, but they all more or less peak at the same time. So if you can't make the muscle normal, at least you can get it to, to squeeze all at the same time. And 
what were our results with uh, these 11 patients? The rejection fractions went up from about 23% to about 40%. The restoration was decreased from 177 milliseconds to 142 milliseconds. The PR intervals improved from 170 milliseconds down to about 108 milliseconds. And eight out of nine survivors showed an increase uh, or an improved New York heart class, a lower number over a median follow-up of about 45 days. So they improved from a New York heart classification of 3.5, so three would be symptoms with minimal exertion, four would be symptoms of rest, to 2.0, which would be symptoms with significant exertion, one would be significant So we concluded from this trial that CRT therapy appears to be effective in, in children with like adults. The trial of CRT pacing may identify patients who respond. Now, we had some significant limitations. This is a retrospective uncontrolled analysis. The majority of our patients were on appropriate medical therapy, but we didn't control the drug doses. And the long-term efficacy is still long-term. This is the only paper out there that really describes CRT in children. Dr. Janicek just presented an abstract form of the European experience. Dr. Dugan correlated the uh, US experience. And we were one of the participating centers of this. But basically what this was, was a retrospective study. We all kicked in our patients uh, and, uh, and uh, correlated these things. And what she concluded was that CRT works in kids too. We only have 103 patients from 22 institutions. Dr. Janicek's paper has about 80. So as far as we can tell, there are only about 200 kids in the world that have undergone CRT uh, in that patient. So the median age was 12. The median duration of follow-up was four months. Majority of patients, 70% had congenital heart disease, while only 16% had idiopathic cardiomyopathy. The cure restoration was 166 milliseconds, which is pretty wide. The ejection fraction was 26%, which is pretty low. And with CRT, the EF increased by about 12%. A few improved sufficiently to allow delisting from the transplant list. A few died, and others underwent transplant. So as best we can tell from the multi-center retrospective survey, this seems to work as well. Uh, so this just looks at uh, the majority were on good medical therapy with two thirds on beta blockers, that is. Okay, dental heart disease. Yeah, not that bad. So how to do this? In bigger kids, you know, kids greater than about 70 pounds or so, we can take the adult approach. All transvenous, ICD, and if you need to go up cardinal for the LDP, you can do that. If they're in the toddler range, we generally use hybrid systems that may have some element of endocardial lead. They may have an epicardial shock array. If they're little, we can go all in the So these are just a few uh, x-rays and images of what our patients look like. So this is a young teenager that has a standard adult fibrillator system. Pectoral implant, transvenous wire. This is a bi system. Right atrial lead, ventricular lead. LV feed via a ventricular branch. So this is a 14 kilogram boy. You can see that the device is quite large compared to his heart. We leave a loop in the wire to allow for somatic growth. Because as these kids grow, they need to stretch. This is an 8 kilogram baby. This defibrillator is almost as big as her right lung. We have cardio leads here. We have a shock patch here, a single patch. Newer defibrillators are active cans, so they only need one away, so it shocks the can, the patch, and patch the can. And this is implanted in the right of the corner. Needless to say, feeding problems are very common at this point. And this is not a simple undertaking. This is a body pacing system to avoid with congenital heart disease. This image is not reversed. His heart really is on the right side of his chest. He has extracardia, he has congenital heart disease, and he has an all in the cardinal system. an adult with congenital heart disease has undergone a setting procedure for transposition of great vessels. What that means is his aorta comes off his right ventricle, his pulmonary artery comes off his left ventricle, the surgeon has rebaffled his atrium such that the blue blood goes to the left ventricle and the red blood goes to the right ventricle. So he's not blue anymore, he's not a blue kid, but he does have an RV as his systemic ventricle and an LV as his pulmonary ventricle. So we have a wire here, a fibrillator wire, transvenous going into his left ventricle. A resync lead here on his anatomic systemic right ventricle, and his atrial lead is actually in his anatomic left atrium. This is a neonate. This is a 
three kilogram bait with the deferred light. There's a epicardial lead sewn onto the surface of the heart for detection and pacing. And the shock array is completely subcutaneous. This is a three finger array that's just tunneled under the skin. Shocks to an active generator right here in the subcytical area. And these leads here are, are posterior, actually on the back of the patient. These kind of unusual lead configurations are uh, fairly common in pediatrics because of our unusual anatomy and our small size. Our students in here from Boston gathered up pediatric experience. And the take home message uh, from this study was that if you had epicardial leads, your defibrillation threshold was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 joules. With about 10 joules with a lead, at least one patch on the heart, you could defibrillate If these were subcutaneous arrays that were under the skin, outside the chest cavity, the average energies were about 20 joules, which is still reasonable. Modern defibrillators can deliver about 35 joules. So in pediatrics, the risk of sudden death appears to be lower than that in developed heart disease. Therefore, the impact of prophylactic defibrillators will be a little bit less. CRT is a viable option in pediatric heart failure. Small size, unusual anatomy, real challenge. Unfortunately, the level of evidence in these studies see small case series. All right, I wanted to finish, really, with what I think you guys can do for us. I use poor clinicians, deal with whatever you do us. Okay. So it's up to you to invent the next generation of great toys. So the future is now. This is what we really need, a medical tricord where you can just go up there and scan the patient. I hear this is available on eBay. It wasn't that much, but I don't know if it's that great. <laughs> so what do we have? We have home heart failure monitoring. So what the Medtronic guys have done and the other companies have done as well is they use vital impedance to determine your respiratory rate. That's one of the rate sensors in rate response to pacing. Well, they said, hey, well, why don't we just chart this and use it as a surrogate for lung water? Water conducts electricity, air does not. If your lungs fill up with water, your impedance drops. Okay. There's a little home box here that you can interrogate your devices as many times a day as you feel like. And you send them to your heart failure doctor, and he gets all these long little graphs here. Basically what this graph says is when you cross this line, your chest water is going way, way up. And they actually um, looked at this, and it does predict the onset of heart failure emission by about two weeks. So when a heart failure guy sees that your fluid is increasing, they call you up and do more direct. This device here is the Medtronic Chronicle. Um, it's a pressure monitor device. Okay? The pulmonary artery diastolic pressure approximates the left atrial pressure. So by continuously measuring the pressure of the pulmonary artery with this pressure lead, which looks a lot like a pacemaker lead, they can tell what your uh, left side is doing. It also looks at activity. You can also look at the force of contractility by looking at the change of pressure and change of time or the DPDT. And you know, you can imagine that with a few other sensors here, you can actually get cardiac output and lots of other good things. There are wearable defibrillators for people that, uh, and we've used these a lot in our heart transplant patients. Somebody that you think is at some risk for arrhythmic death, but is only going to need a device for about six months until they get the heart. It doesn't make much sense to implant a $22,000 device. So we rented this thing. It's about uh, 400 a month, and it's a wearable defibrillator. My basic waveform, dry electrodes, no seat pads. Very nice, but it is kind of big. New electrical therapies, there's this thing called CCM, or cardiac contractility modulation. It's not a pacemaker, it is a stimulator. So what happens is if you burst pace during the absolute refractory period, somehow the electrical signal influences intracellular, or you think intracellular calcium handling, and you can improve the force of contraction. This device is undergoing uh, clinical trials at Pulse Dynamics, I think, gives off of investment measures. But uh, it's a very promising study, because imagine one of the problems with defibrillators. Somebody has VF, they get shocked. They go into EMD, or Electromechanical Dissociation, also known as pulse electroconductivity. This may be due to electroporation, this may be due to myocardial stunning. And now you've converted them out of their arrhythmia, and their heart is not squeezing. So if you can integrate this into their defibrillator, Give them some CCM, we might be able to get the heart to actually pump part of it. Unanswered questions in the device. There are two, I think, you know, if I could have two things, this is what I would want. How do you evaluate the synchrony in the setting of heart failure? 
In other words, who are candidates for CRT? So remember, under the best circumstances, you know, really wide QRS, heart failure, the no-brainer, uh, two-thirds of the three-quarters respond, one-third to one-quarter do not, some actually get four. So how do you select people? Otherwise, um, how do you optimize people? Okay. Is everybody's left bundle branch the same? Or are there some people that need placement in a different place? Maybe they don't need a lateral thing. Maybe they need an anterior thing, posterior thing, upper party. Maybe they need a right-sided thing. Maybe they have right bundle branch. Okay. So what are the components of a mechanical system? So I broke it down quite simply. That's the way I think. There's excitation. There's excitation, contraction, coupling, and there's contraction. So when we think about bundle branch blocks, and this is a little cartoon of a left bundle branch block. So the impulse goes down the right bundle, goes across the myocardium, goes off the left side. So excitation is messed up. So the heart is activated inappropriately. But we don't think too much about this. So let's say that um, the only anomaly is excitation. So if you take this little cartoon, we know from old studies and from neuron uh, ZCGI stuff that the heart is generally activated endocardium to epicardium apex to base. So this is sort of a hypothetical activation sequence. So the apex is activated first, the mid is activated next, the base is activated last. The time from the onset of the QRS to the end of the base, 100 milliseconds, normal QRS. Here's somebody with the hypothetical left bundle bridge block. Septum's activated just as before, free wall, activated late, LB base activated most late. So if we want to think about the three elements, there's time to local electrical activation. Well, that's 50, second, no, 50 milliseconds later. Time for excitation, contraction, coupling. Let's assume that that's normal. Time for contraction, let's assume that's normal. Is the observed mechanical disagreement due solely to the electrical load? Okay, so what do we do? We go get our CS lead in place, and we just put a pacing lead here, by the way. We pace this site 50 milliseconds early. Make this 150, 100. That should fix everything. But what if this area is electrically late and it's mechanically late? So let's say that the local electrical impulse arrives here 50 milliseconds late. But whatever sarcolamal things are involved in excitation contraction coupling is also 50 milliseconds late. And what if the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the myocardial filaments and all that are 50 milliseconds late? How are you going to get this area to move on top? You're going to have to pace this 50 milliseconds early even before the QRS onset, or 100 milliseconds before it would have been activated. You have to pre-excite this area okay, to get the muscle to move on time. So this explains one of the dichotomies in cardiac resynchronization therapy that's been observed. The degree of improvement with CRT therapy does not correlate to the degree of QRS narrowing. On average, people that get CRT have narrower QRSs. But you can have people that respond brilliantly whose QRS does not change all that much. You can have people whose QRS is shrinked and next to nothing, they don't respond at all. Okay. So as a population, CRT reduces QRS duration. But in each individual person, the magnitude of their benefit is not predicted by the QRS. And this might explain that. Maybe you need to widen up the QRS by pre exciting this area to get it to move on time because mechanical synchrony is what we're after, not necessarily the previous level of QRS. So what is the current status of electromechanical mapping? Okay. There's a system called the NOVA system. It allowed, it's a catheter-based system uh, that you place into the uh, heart, into the uh, vessels, and as the heart beats, the system tracks how far the catheter moves, and you can figure out from each point how far it moves consistently, how far it moves vastly. You can generate a chamber geometry, you can come up with a composite ejection direction. You can also interrogate the time of activation of that one point. So this system allows for simultaneous detection of local electrical and mechanical activation. It's invasive, it's expensive, and the NOGA is no longer available because nobody bought it. So this system went out of existence a few years ago. But as far as I can tell, this is the only attempt at integrating these two things. And this really wasn't developed in the area of, era of cardiac synchronization. This was used to sort of map out myocardial scars and things like that. I think it was actually funded as an adjunct to transmyocardial laser revascularization. Now I came up with this idea. So it, we have the technology now to do this on invasive. Well, we've seen from our triplane echo friends that we can develop a three-dimensional geometry of the ventricle. We can 
simultaneously acquire three or five airplanes on top of the sphere. You can come up with local contraction times. This is tissue velocity imaging, or time to deep shortening. And okay? you can map that. Red areas are delayed, green areas are normal. So you can do this in real time. And then you can get this thing, get a CT, run it through your arm spring, and then come up with an app of heartbeat. And if you can unify this with this, I mean, you can figure it out. You can figure out whether the mechanical delay is solely due to the electrical delay. Whether there's additional delay, it's not explained by the delay. This would allow you to custom target your CRT for each patient. You can tell which areas are the latest, which areas are viable, which areas have good voltages, where it plays your This is an example of um, one of the kits that we uh, did recently. Uh, this is a uh, real-time tri-plane imaging. Three views, 60 degrees apart of the, of a dyskinetic septum. So this is the left ventricle here, this is the free wall, this is the septum, it's a little dark. And if you just look at this corner, you can see that the septum just flies away. It's, it's wobbling. So when the LV free wall moves in, the septum just falls away. And this is the uh, same patient um, with the CRT basically turned on. This is a temporary trial that you can have that. You can see here the illustrations are quite wide. And this is what they look like with the patient turned on. Now, septum is still paradoxical. It still flops away, but it doesn't flop away as much. What's the other thing that I really want? Does ICE need their capital? Are there any things we can do? Anti-tech pacing, low energy generation. This is an interesting study that was done out of Boston looking at quality of life in children with uh, different motors. And what it found was that they're anxious, they're depressed, and the association between anxiety and depression was more correlated to their device than the severity of their heart disease. So these kids with internal defibrillators were more worried about their defibrillator than they worried about their heart disease. How can we make this less painful? Uh, what is the current status of anti-attack and right pacing? Well, you've got this. This is called the ATP during charge. So what the modern defibrillators can do now is when they detect arrhythmia, as they're charging up the big capacitor, they'll give a couple volleys of anti-attack pacing. And if it works, they abort the shock. Because these are non-committed shocks. The older defibrillators, once they detect it, once they charge, they're going to get shocked, even if they're really stopped. Did this actually work? I'm going to try to sponsor a trial called Pain 3 that looked at the success of ATP um, in people with defibrillators. And they were able to reduce the shocks quite a bit and they to be success, uh, successful in a you know, fairly high number. Many of the VF episodes started as VT, but the true VF, as we understand it, this is not going to work. These are a couple slides I stole from the Equals website looking at low energy shocks. I mean, you guys can really unpin reentry and fire little shocks between the QRSs and defibrillate the heart with minimal energy. You know, this is a 0.2 joule shock. Imperceptible. The adult data says anything under one tool is This would be great. Kinder, gentler, painless, and hemodynamically gentle in relation. Because the idea is to save lives, not just to stop. This is the holy grail of ice. The ice is getting smaller and it lasts forever. So, in conclusion, sudden arrhythmic death and normal electrical activation are prominent aspects of adult AMP death and heart failure. There are devices currently available that address these issues. Although generally effective, the applicability of device therapy to adult with pediatric heart failure depends critically on characterization of the individual electromechanical abnormality in the CRT patient. No simple, non-invasive, reproducible modality currently exists to accomplish this task, although we hope to change that. Defibrillation therapy, as it currently exists, increases quantity of life but decreases quality of life. A lot of people say, turn my defibrillator off. Newer devices and waveforms may significantly improve quality and quality of life. Questions? Comments? To what extent does uh, knowing exactly where you could place a need help you if you're limited in terms of where you can In terms of the adult coronary sinus venous implants, you're limited to anterior vein, lateral, lateral vein, and posterior vein. 
And what we've done and what our adult colleagues have started to do is when we thread the electrode out, it just lands where it lands. But we look for late sensing. If your resynchronization lead is activated in the first half of the QRS complex, this is probably not going to be a good resynchronization site. So you can look for other vessels, other veins. Uh, it hasn't come to a point now where an adult implanter would abandon an implant, recommend a surgical approach just based on that. But that is one of the things that we look at. Is, is this a late site? Pacing early sites earlier is not going to make any difference. All late sites um, are not necessarily the best, but uh, the early is no good. What is that plot of transplant plateau at six months? What are I think the numbers sort of fall out. You know, uh, they either get transplanted, the numbers get small. Um, I didn't uh, put on that Kaplan Meyer the number left. And some of these people may get better. Uh, you don't exactly know why they got on the list. Maybe they had a myocarditis that resolved. They got listed because they were acutely ill and we didn't know if they were going to survive. And then they improved to the point that they came off. So uh, once the data gets you know, further out, uh, the, the, the statistics that come So again, why is the percentage of transplant, why is it so much higher than adults? Because the numbers are so much smaller? Yeah, I think it's, it's really um, a donor to uh, recipient balance equation. There are not many pediatric donors, but there are not that many kids waiting for the transplant. The real problem is in our adolescents, and there was some legislation that, that passed looking at that. A teenager waiting for a heart has to complete, compete with every single adult out there. So if there is an 18-year-old donor, that heart could go into a 55-year-old man or a 16-year-old kid. So what's happened now with organ allocation is that pediatric donors will go to pediatric <coughs> unless there is not a pediatric recipient available. Because these kids, the teenagers, would never get out. Mm -hmm. the, uh, if I remember correctly, 40% of the kids died of pump failure. Is that correct? Yep. Of, the, of the 16%, 40% were pump failure? So I wonder, just to get an idea, if you went back what, how many of those kids would have qualified for CRT? We don't know. This database, there, there are two large pediatric cardiomyopathy databases out there. One is the PHTS, which captures people at the time of listing, and there's another one called the PCMR, or Pediatric Cardiomyopathy Registry. The PHTS uh, is the one that we work with, does not capture EKG data, at least not in, in a computerized form. The hard copies are there for anyone that wants to measure. So we don't know uh, what percentage of those people were qualified, but uh, it's the general feeling among pediatric cardiologists that most of our patients with heart failure have symmetric heart failure. They're not dyssynchronous. They have a narrow thrust complex. And that's that's probably pretty much true. We very seldom see a left heart failure. Well. Where I think our patients have the wide thrust is the previously paced patient. This is another interesting thing in, in, in pacing is that a lot of right ventricular pacing is bad. RV pacing gives you a similar looking QRS and similar cardiac activation sequence to left heart block. So it's been pretty well shown that people with congenital complete heart block that start getting RV pacing, a certain percentage of them will go on heart failure. And the thought had been, this is uh, late lupus cardiomyopathy. The lupus antibodies not only wiped out the uh, conductive system, they also damaged the myocardium. Well, then why were they fine 12 years before they got the device and they went another five or six months after they started the pacing? Peter Karpowicz in Michigan has looked at histologic changes in young animals with RV pacing and there are marked histologic changes. Whether that correlates to heart failure or not, we'll see. But it may very well be that our paced patients are developing a pacing cardiomyopathy. Not all of them, not most of them, but a certain subset of them. And that seems to be the no-brainer in the pediatric series. A lot of them are normally in the pacing of the it was a it was a majority, but it was from uh, the end of and the end of the which uh, was interesting Yeah, that's brought up some other things in adults, too. Um, body pacing is technically very difficult. Uh, cannulating the coronary sinus is not easy. Uh, there could be things that can happen. You can dissect the coronary sinus injury. One of the things that the adults have been looking at is site-selected pacing. Can you place your RV lead in a different place? So the RV apex, although uh, mechanically is the easiest place to put a lead, it's very secure, the leads don't dislodge. Electrically, it's about the worst place you can face the heart. The so there have been alternative sites like the RV Alpha Tract, RV Septum, and a few groups have even uh, tried 
reproducibly to do direct his bundle pacing, where they map the common bundle of his and screw the matricular lead right into the his bundle. That's also technically very difficult to do. But there's a lot of research looking at alternative site pacing. Can you find another spot in the RV that results in a less desynchrony and better long-term outlook? But the problem with that, that Medtronic is sponsored a trial that's called the uh, Block HF trial. People with standard indications for pacing get randomized to standard pacing or bundle pacing to see if they can prevent pacing cutting out. The problem with that is the event rate's going to be low. Majority of people do fine, just aren't capable of pacing. So how can you <coughs> sub-select that group that is going to develop problems before they show up in full heart mode? Okay, well thank you so much. It was really a spectacular